what we're going to talk to, about, um, at least to start with today, is another example of using the derivative to estimate how the function changes. This example is a very canonical example, by, um, by which I mean that it shows up in all of the textbooks and it has its own name. And that is the example of marginal analysis. And this is an example from business. and economics. And it's just doing what we were doing yesterday with a specific um, sort of class of functions. So let's say that you are manufacturing and selling. What am I doing? Selling products. This is how marginal analysis is traditionally presented. You don't have to literally be manufacturing the objects in a factory. You are acquiring objects and then you are selling them. And we normally think of that as a manufacturing process, but you could also be buying products at a bulk price and um, then selling them anything where you get products and then sell products. And money is going to change hands in both sides sort of of this equation. Whether you're manufacturing objects in a factory or buying them in bulk or however you're acquiring them, acquiring these objects to sell is going to have some kind of cost associated to it. You're not getting these products for free. On the flip side, when you do sell the product, you generate money called the revenue. And you can take the cost and you can take the revenue. And if you know both these things, you define a third function, a profit function, which is revenue minus the cost. And we're going to keep doing what we were doing yesterday in reference to these three functions. So X is going to be the number of units acquired and sold. So notice that we're making a simple Simplifying assumption here, we're assuming that we can sell everything we acquire. So in particular, we're assuming that we don't have a bunch of stuff sitting in a warehouse costing us rent money to store and not generating any revenue for us. Everything we acquire, whether we're manufacturing it or buying it or whatever, we're going to sell. 
Well, I talked about the cost and the revenue. Presumably, the cost and the revenue depend on the number of units that you're acquiring. I mean, if you're buying in bulk, for example, presumably acquiring a thousand units is cheaper than acquiring 10,000 units. So this cost function takes the number of units as its argument. And let me just use manufacture from now on. The cost to manufacture X units. And presumably, again, the revenue depends on the number of units you're selling. I mean, one would hope that the more units one sells, the more revenue one earns. So revenue also takes X as its input. And then this profit function is defined in terms of the cost and the revenue. So we can define a profit function Profit from manufacturing X units. In practice, the cost is always going to be positive. The revenue should always be positive, but the profit can be positive or negative. If the profit is positive, we say we are in the back we are making money. If the profit is negative, we say we are in the red, we are losing money. And the derivative of these functions that we just put on the board get their own names, the derivative of the cost function is called the marginal cost. And remember our kind of informal understanding of the derivative from class yesterday, the marginal cost of a number is the cost to produce one additional unit if you are already producing 10 units. So let's make sure we understand this before we go any further. Let's, we can look at a graph. We can look at the number of units and we can look at the cost and say that K is here and K plus one is there. 
and it costs however much it costs to produce k units and it costs however much to produce k plus one units. This vertical distance is C prime of k, the additional cost from producing one additional unit. And I'll give people a moment to write that down. Let me make the observation. I can say it while people are writing that the marginal revenue and the marginal profit can be defined in very similar ways. The marginal Revenue is the derivative of the revenue function, just like the marginal cost is the derivative of the cost function. And once again, this is giving you how the revenue changes if you increase the number of units sold. So if you're currently manufacturing and selling K units, you make some revenue. If you increase the number of units you sell by one, you presumably increase that revenue, but how much do you increase that revenue by? Well, approximately by R prime of K. And we should remind ourselves that this is an approximation. There's no guarantee this is going to be exact, but Finally, we can define the marginal profit. And again, the marginal profit is trying to tell you how much your profit increases or decreases because profit can do both. But how much your profit changes if you increase your manufacturing. So if you go from K to K plus one units, and maybe that's a mistake. Maybe going from K to K plus one units is causing your profit to decrease. But this distance is the marginal profit. <clears throat> and in this particular case, because profit is decreasing, that marginal profit is going to be a negative. Let's investigate this statement that, um, that the profit can decrease. Let's investigate, and I mean, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not an economist, but let's investigate cost function. Cost functions are often assumed to be a cubic polynomials.
So the cost function is often assumed to look something like that. Uh, so as X increases, the cost of manufacturing or otherwise acquiring X units also increases. So let me uh, try this again, just so that it will be easier for you to see. Let's make this kind of Suddenly, I can't draw a cubic. So this would be a very extreme example, but this illustrates the property that cost functions have that cause them to be used in this way. As the number of units increases, the cost increases. Very well, that makes sense, that's intuitive. But at some point, the cost flattens out and acquiring more units is not increasing the cost very much at all. Well, that's an expected feature of the graph called economy of scale. And I mean, the most obvious illustration of economy of scale is bulk ordering something. If you bulk order, you can get discounts and you can get charged less per item than you would be charged if you just buy one or two of them. Eventually, economy of scale breaks. This starts going up quickly again. And this is a diseconomy of scale. Not the most creative name, but at least pretty straightforward. And I mean, the reason economy of scale eventually breaks, I mean, just to give a few examples, was your manufacturing objects. At some point, your factory is going to be at capacity and manufacturing more objects is going to be an expensive expansion. It's going to mean hiring more people. It's going to cause prices to increase very rapidly. Meanwhile, revenue functions are often assumed to be a linear. Like if you're selling objects at six, $60 per object, your revenue function is R of X equals 60 X. That's a straight line. And if we put a revenue function on the board, you see there's this sweet spot where the revenue is higher. I guess I'm kind of kind of a perverse color choice. Um, we are in the black here. So let me use black 
instead of red. Our revenue is higher than our cost. We are making a profit. That is good. If we are selling too few objects, we're losing money, we're in the red, but also if we are selling too many objects, we're losing money and are in the red. So there's this sort of sweet spot where our revenue is more than compensating for our manufacturing costs, and that's good. We can lose money either on the left or sort of surprisingly on the right. If we're manufacturing and selling too many objects, our cost will get out of control, our revenue will not increase to compensate, and we'll start to lose money. And therefore, of course, economists are very interested in looking at these graphs and trying to predict, trying to answer questions like, how much, how many units should a business manufacture and sell under these conditions? What's the point of diminishing returns? At what point should they stop increasing their manufacturing? Questions like that. And how to this? and help answer these questions. Let's put some concrete functions on the board and then let's answer some questions. So as I promised, let's say our cost function is cubic. x cubed minus 6x squared plus 15x. And this is the cost to manufacture or otherwise acquire x. units of something. And assuming that we're not adjusting our prices, our revenue can be linear. Um, we'll, uh, we'll make $60 on every sale, and that will just not change. And let's ask some questions. Notice I haven't put the profit function on the board. There's no need to explicitly state the profit function, but we can. The profit function is defined in terms of the revenue and cost. So if you know revenue and you know cost, you know the profit. Even if I don't have a form to the for it written on the board. Is everyone at this point still following along? Does anybody have any questions before I kind of dive into this? Then let's say I'm going to give myself some space to work. And 
particular. I'm going to recop. I'm going to copy this back down. I'm just going to shrink my writing a little so that I have a little more room on the left hand side of the board. C of X is still the right hand side of the board. C of X is still. This cubic polynomial R of X is still this linear function. And let's say that we're currently manufacturing and selling at, uh, not X, some number, 10 units of something. So question one is not a count to this question, but let's take a look at our profit. <coughs> our current profit. Are we in the back? Are we in the red? Is our profit positive or negative? Well, as I say, this isn't a calculus problem. This is a subtraction problem, really. The profit is the revenue minus the cost. So the profit specifically, when X equals 10, <laughs> is the revenue when X is 10 minus the cost when X is 10. And let me, I always forget to get this calculator loaded before class. Let's do that now. It'll take 30 seconds to a minute. won't name names, but I did once work at a college that was like, we don't want to pay for this emulation software. You should just pirate it. And we did get a much better experience with our pirated software than we do with our paid software. But we're going to plug 10 into this. Are we sharing this so that it's in our recording? So we can no longer see those formulas, but I have them in our sheet. Here's what we get when we plug 10 into the revenue. When we plug 10 into the cost, we get 10 cubed minus six times 10 squared plus 15 times 10. So let's make this less depressing by saying that we're measuring stuff in the thousands of dollars. So we're not going to all this trouble to get $50 back again. Let's say that's $50,000 back again. And now let's ask if we up 
production to eleven units. Then using the tools of calculus to approximate this, how will the profit change? Do we think this will increase our profit or do we think this will decrease our profit? And if we're asking what happens when we go from 10 to 11, then we are asking for the marginal profit at 10. This is what we need to answer that question. And the marginal profit at 10, here's where we'll use the fact that if we've got subtraction, we just take the individual derivatives and subtract them. The derivative of the profit is the derivative of the revenue minus the derivative of the cost. And now those revenue and cost functions aren't uh, super ugly. We can hopefully just take both these derivatives. The derivative of the revenue is 60. The derivative of the cost is 3x squared minus 12x plus 15. Is the C supposed to be 10 instead of 11? Ah, you are right. Okay. Good catch. Thank you. So we find each of the derivatives, then we plug 10 into them and subtract. So this maybe I'll just uh, maybe I won't bother sharing this calculator because I'm not doing anything really exciting here. I'm going to plug 10 in. So when I plug 10 into 60, well, you just get 60. Heavens, the screen is cluttered. When you plug 10 into this, let's see. 10 squared is 100. So 3 times 100 is 300. 12 times 10 is 120, so minus 120, 15 is constant, so plus 15, we press enter, and we, um, we get something negative. So if we increase manufacturing, that's a bad idea. Our profit, I mean, our revenue will go up 
but our costs will go up more, our revenue will not outpace our cost, and we will lose money, lose a significant amount of money, in fact, if we go from 10 to 11. Let's, uh, let's take a look at the graphs. Let's take do some a little graphical, not email, Firefox. There we go. Let me, everything is hiding now. Let me share this. So here's the revenue. And here is the cost. I know you can't really see a whole lot because of our scale. That's not that X be so big. Maybe let's that X go from zero to 50. Let's increase Y though here. So what we're seeing here sort of makes sense. Um, when we are manufacturing 10 units, our revenue function is higher than the cost function. If we go from 10 units to 11 units, that's, that's where my cursor is now, then my cost has out, then our cost has outpaced our revenue. The blue function is higher. So it makes sense that we're now losing money. And if we define our profit function to be our revenue function minus our cost function, you see that our profit enters the negative area between 10 and 11. We also see that we are already manufacturing far too many objects. I mean, at 10, our revenue is bigger than the cost, so we are making a bit of a profit. But the maximum value of the profit will occur if we're manufacturing so around six units. So we not only should we not increase our production, we really ought to be scaling it back dramatically. And this is a, I mean, obviously we're just doing it on the computer right now, but finding maximum values, like finding the value where your cost is max, where your profit is maximized, is a pretty significant application of calculus. Your, Desmos is behind the scenes running a calculus algorithm to find this maximum. Let's see. I will say, just so there is no confusion, the mar if the marginal profit is negative, that's certainly bad. If the marginal profit is negative, it means that in producing more units will cause your profit to go down. But that doesn't mean that you'll start losing money if you produce another unit. This is a very extreme case because we started right on the edge of where we were still profitable. 
all that the marginal profit being negative means is that your profit will decrease if you produce another unit. So maybe you're currently making a profit of 100,000, upping your production will cause you to make a profit of 90,000. You are still in the red, but you've decreased the amount of money that you're making. So this is a very, I mean, I wasn't trying to make it such, but this ended up being a very extreme example. Just as I say, because we were on the very edge of where it was profitable to begin with. <coughs> That's okay, this is good. I wanted to spend time on this. We're still not done with the section. Our next application will present this Thursday and we're on schedule. I was only planning to cover this section, but our next application is going to require a little background, a little mathematical background. Our next application is motion, velocity and acceleration and position and all of that stuff. And for that application, we're going to need the concept of higher order derivatives. And this concept is not, I think, a super complicated one. I mean, based on experience teaching the class, I don't think students tend to find it complicated. It's just, suppose you have a function, f of x equals 3x squared. You can take the derivative of this, f prime of x equals 6x. And all we're now going to do is make the observation that f prime of x is a function, and we can take its derivative just like we took the derivative of 3x squared, we can take the derivative of 6x. And our notation here is, well, when we take a derivative, we add an apostrophe between the f and the argument. We already have an apostrophe here, so when we take the derivative of this, we'll once again add an apostrophe, and now we'll have two apostrophes. F double prime of X equals six. And F double prime of X is a function. You could take its derivative, add an apostrophe, f triple prime of x equals zero. That's a function. You could take its derivative. At this point, at just if we just keep adding apostrophes, it's going to get very awkward to read very quickly. At this point, if we're now taking the fourth derivative, we took the derivative once, twice, three times. Now we're taking the derivative four times. 
we put a little four in parentheses next to the F. F, the fourth derivative, the derivative of the zero function is still the zero function because the derivative of any constant is zero. This is a constant, its derivative is zero. And we could keep doing this. We could take the fifth, sixth, seventh derivatives. Um, in practice, those are what we're going to spend almost all of this class looking at. We care about the derivative, and sometimes we care about the derivative of the derivative. Very rarely would we want the derivative of the derivative of the derivative. I'm, I'm lost count, but very rarely would we want this. And I can't think, I mean, I'm sure there are applications of this somewhere, but I can't think of any applications of the fourth order derivative or higher. So I've been saying these words, but let's make sure they're written on the page as well. Let's maybe get rid of that. It's cluttering things up. The derivative of the derivative is called the second derivative. And this is, of course, just the derivative of f. But if we're confused that we'll get the derivative and the second derivative confused, we sometimes call that the first derivative. And if you'll bear with me for just the two minutes we have remaining, this is the Grange notation. I've said that we can also write the derivative using Leibniz notation dy dx. Our notation for the second derivative, if we're using Leibniz notation, is kind of awkward. We're going to put a two between the D and the Y up there. But what makes it kind of awkward is that we don't have symmetry. We're going to put a two in the denominator as well, but we put it somewhere else. We put it to the right of the X. So there's the de second derivative using Leibniz notation. This generalizes in the natural way if we wanted the third derivative, let's say, instead of a two, we put a three. All right, class is over. Thank you for your attention. We'll pick up, uh, pick up with more applications tomorrow.